Good morning, everyone. It is Tuesday, November 16th. Welcome into the morning medical update. Same show, just some musical chairs today because we have two great guests in studio and Dr. Steve Stites with us. So I am happy to be bumped down the hall and let Stites take the reins this morning <laughs> out there for us. So we'll get to them in just a moment. But coming up today, we are talking about preparing for all emergencies, including COVID-19. We are joined today by members of U.S. Health and Human Services. We're going to talk about vaccine distributions and how the office coordinates all public health emergencies throughout Kansas and Missouri. So make sure you get in your great questions. You can do that via YouTube. Facebook and the Medical News Network. There are the links right there on your screen. So think of your questions and we'll get to those in a bit. But first, let's get to Dr. Dana Hawkinson with our numbers this morning. Good morning to you. Hi. Hi. Yeah, today we have um, 21 active infections. It's bumped up a little bit. You know, we have to wait and see what the full uh, trend is, but 21 active infections, seven in the ICU and four of those on the ventilator. Uh, we also have 24 in that recovery period as well, so a total of 45. And Hayes has 10 active infections and five in that recovery period. And, you know, we have talked about, see, how we saw um, a dip in the total cases, uh, but now we, we really haven't seen that dip anymore. It's kind of trending back up. It is. And, you know, this is, um, this is for the United States. This is for our community uh, specifically as well. And so that's really concerning, but there continues to be supportive data that this continues to be now a pandemic of the unvaccinated as 90 plus percent of the people you know, who are dying continue to be unvaccinated. You know, Hawk, I think that's exactly right. And what we know too, coming out of Lawrence is some wastewater testing showing that the last two data points are the highest that they have been mm. the, the entire mm. pandemic. And that, that should concern us, right? Because we know that the wastewater testing historically yeah. has predicted the rise in case counts. Mm -hmm. We are not, that shouldn't surprise us. Masks came off about, you know, well, definitely two or three weeks right. ago, but often longer than that. Yeah. And I think we are seeing it throughout the country, Colorado, Montana, the Mountain West, and other areas, even Vermont. When you start taking masks off and you go indoors, people are going to get sick again, and we're gonna see an increasing rise of COVID-19 numbers. And that's exactly what we're starting to see. And I'm, I'm concerned, you know, two things. A, the dip never, didn't go as low as it did last yeah, spring when we got concern. down to two or three patients mm -hmm. a day, which was, you know, that was that was picnic city, really. And then the, the, the now we're, we're, we're seeing this, this, the dip went down to the 14, 15 range and it's starting to accelerate up. I think, unfortunately, we're gonna still see that continue to rise. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, you know, and we have said it, it's not all about cases because we probably don't count all the cases because some people, number one, won't get tested or will do at-home tests. But it's also, it's not all about, it's not fully about deaths as we've seen, uh, you know, continued research showing the impact of those post-acute syndromes, those long COVID, up to 50% of people now for almost six months or more. And so, Well, in that article in Jaminet that popped yep. out yesterday and quoted in the Washington Post reported it today, showing the significance of the long-term side effects yep. of COVID across the world, but also saying, look, vaccination looks like one of the ways out of that. Yep. So I know we're gonna get into that conversation with our, our guests, but, uh, but we probably ought to find out, uh, Jess, if there are any reporter questions coming out. Oh, we can't hear you. It's the unmute button. You haven't practiced that at all throughout it's the pandemic, mute, have you? <laughs> there it goes. Now we can't. You, you were talking there a minute ago. Nope. I'm just pressing buttons. Okay, good. That's what my wife does. I can't get the channel changer to work. What's going on? I'm pressing all your buttons this morning. Okay, good. We can, hear can you. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, do we have reporters on the line? Let's get to those. Okay. Clear. All right, so community questions are coming up here in just a bit. So I am gonna to toss it back to Dr. Seitz in the studio so we can get to our great guests and our great conversation. Go for all right, it. This is, this is gonna be fun. I can't wait to have this conversation with you guys. So first of all, Dr. Catherine Soderwhite, she is the Regional Administrator for Health and Human Services and Don O'Connell, now this is a lot of words, folks, and I'm gonna shorten it. The Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, Health and Human Services. We're gonna call Assistant Secretary Don O'Connell, we're just gonna say Secretary O'Connell because that's a lot easier to say. And that whole other part, we're just gonna call it ASPR, okay? We're all good, that's our terminology, <laughs> definition's done. All right, first of all, let's, uh, let's uh, turn to you, uh, Secretary O'Connell. Tell us a little bit about what your part of HHS does. Well, what is this, a whole Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response or ASPR, what is that? Absolutely, well thank you, first of all, so much for having me. What a treat to be here 
uh, this morning. I had a wonderful tour of the hospital and was extraordinarily impressed uh, by all the work that the team did uh, to get through uh, these first 21 months of the pandemic. So let me just convey. Thank you. Thank you. Great my team. Great team throughout Kansas City. Absolutely, Lots of good Absolutely folks. terrific. Um, so I am the Assistant Secretary, as you mentioned, for Preparedness and Response, which is quite a mouthful. We are the, uh, the youngest Assistant Secretary position within HHS, and we were born out of two tragedies that we saw in the early 2000s. First, out of September 11th, um, and then out of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, the government came together and realized that we actually needed to have some sort of coordinated approach to public health preparedness and response. You know, we see the terrific work that FEMA does around logistics for disasters of any sort. Um, and we add an additional layer to that. We do the public health pieces. Uh, so we've got a couple of components that I think are interesting to, uh, to the team here at the hospital and uh, within the community. One, we're responsible for the strategic national stockpile. So early in the pandemic, when people needed to access PPE and ventilators, uh, you know, in states and localities were struggling with the medical supply chain and getting the things that they needed to respond. It was uh, the ASPR organization through the Strategic National Stockpile that worked to distribute PPE and ventilators uh, to the communities in need. Uh, we are also securing the medical supply chain. One of the things we learned early on in the pandemic was when the whole world needs the same thing at the exact same time and they're all produced overseas, it's very challenging to get uh, the personal protective equipment and other medical supplies that our first responders and frontline healthcare workers need. And so we're working hard and in investing in increasing domestic manufacturing. Uh, we're also uh, get, getting warm base uh, manufacturing lines so we can turn things on and turn things off really quickly. We've seen that with testing. You know, testing wasn't very sexy in the spring. Everyone was focused on vaccines, rightfully so. That's one of our best tools in the toolkit. But now, once we had the Delta surge and, and, and schools are reopening and businesses are reopening, we've needed to have rapid at-home tests. And we've had to ramp that up. Uh, there was significant testing capacity early. Uh, it, it, it diminished in the spring when people weren't doing as much testing. And we've had to very quickly ramp that up. So we're learning what it means to keep some warm base uh, manufacturing possibilities uh, online uh, to turn on and turn on, turn on and turn off very quickly. Those are just an, a few examples of what we do. One more thing, actually, that might be helpful for the community is we bring in medical surge teams. So we've actually sent 27 teams uh, into communities since July, 24-person uh, teams uh, full of clinicians who can actually augment hospitals in need who are overwhelmed by COVID patients. Over uh, 600 team members have deployed in these last several months to support communities in need. So that's another uh, one of the components that the ASPR organization has. So we're, we're pretty well-rounded, but we're focused on preparedness and response to support communities in need, uh, whatever the need might be in the public health realm. And Senator O'Connor, tell us a little bit about how ASPR and HHS have worked in our region of the country. What, what's, what's happened here? Well, you know, Region 7, which is, what, uh, which is where we are today, uh, there are 10 regions, and this is Region 7, has not asked for a significant amount of support. Yeah. Um, and I just saw why. Walking through the hospital this morning, I can see, uh, what, you know, what an extraordinary response uh, system you had in place already, and you were able to augment uh, the ICU care uh, very easily and very quickly. So it was very impressive. Uh, but we have uh, distributed um, 3.7 million pieces of PPE to the region. And this region includes not just Missouri, but Kansas, Iowa, and Nebraska. So across those four states, uh, we've also made significant number of ventilators available mm -hmm. across those states. So we, and we remain at, you know, at, at your beck and call, should you all need some support in addition to what we've already sent, uh, we'd be happy uh, to make that support available. You all have just been very, very self-sufficient. People, and here's the rule, okay? Remember, the rules of infection prevention and control travel with you wherever you go. They mm. keep you safe, even into this moment, every day going forward. So we don't need the Assistant Secretary's help because we can manage this. But what do we have to do? Hawkeye. We got to keep our masks on. We got to stay safe. Yep. We got to practice infection control because whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, masking still works. Yeah, I think we've we've kind of really moved into that phase now because we know that there isn't a lot of um, restrictions or mandates in place. So it's kind of really boiling down to people's own risk tolerance, assessing and evaluating those situations, especially those high risk situations, which you're talking about, Steve. And it is masking 
distancing. You know, if you have to be indoors, understand what is that area like. Is it is it larger with better ventilation or is it smaller? And it's really understanding those as well as the most important thing is getting vaccinated. Yeah, and, and I'm afraid as we see the wastewater testing, we see masks yep. coming off, we see the numbers ticking up, something wicked this way comes mm. again. Dr. Satterwhite, some new medications are going to come out in the not-so-distant future with some pills from Pfizer and Merck. Talk to us a little bit about that because I think I'm pretty excited. Hawkeye's always more measured than I am, yeah. so he's he, he's better about he that. Just, but I'm pretty excited. It, you know, close to his yeah, mind. he does. He does. He tries to keep it close to the vest, but... How are we going to do? When are those coming out? What so actually, I want to highlight. So I'm glad you glad, glad you raised that because one of the other things that Asper has done um, for the whole country, but including for Region Seven, is they have a whole group of people that work on medical countermeasures, and so that means a lot of different things. You know, as vaccine is our our most important tool, we talk about that all the time yeah, on this show. Yeah, we're coming back to that one. Yeah, yeah, we're going to come back to that. But there are other tools in our toolbox um, that can be used even if somebody has been vaccinated and they get sick. Did you just put your finger up? This is like when you, you're talking to your kids. I mean, your kids, I feel kids like know my that kids finger, would don't be they? Like, no, no, they finger, know that finger. No finger. Does your husband? Um, know that finger? But even uh, so, and Maybe one of tool those box. tools that we've also talked a lot about on this show is monoclonal antibodies, and that has been a, an enormous coordinated HHS effort. So one thing we've been able to do in Region Seven is work as an HHS team. So Asper has been our leader in the management of COVID, the COVID nineteen response. But just like everywhere, like at the hospital, we know that there are different people who play different roles to contribute to doing the best job we can to serve the needs of our population. Um, so I work a lot on the public health sort of expertise side. My Asper colleagues work a lot on the, the logistics and the movement and the planning and really coordinating the response around these medical um, countermeasures like monoclonal antibodies. So going back to, so we do have some exciting um, hopefully some exciting additional tools in the pipeline, including oral, oral antivirals. Um, we know that an EUA application has been submitted to FDA for those drugs and um, that those will be reviewed using the same process that we've reviewed vaccines um, and monoclonal antibodies and, and the other tools. So we are, however, we don't know when that EUA is gonna be issued, but we're planning. And that's one of the, the things that Asper does is uh, really works like, okay, when this becomes available, how are we gonna get that out to the public? So um, Dr. Hoxson, do you wanna comment on the use of the oral antivirals? Yeah, I mean, it, it does look to be extremely important. You know, we know the monoclonal antibodies have saved a lot of people from going to the hospital and going to the ICU. It's just sometimes it's a little bit more difficult because it is an IV type of medication. And so there is um, some logistical issues there. Um, manpower to be able to give them, to have people staffing those areas, but also the time it takes to get them. Certainly we know with the pills it will be, um, and what it sounds like is it will be very good. It will be even better than Tamiflu as far as hope, help, ho hopefully protecting against progression of disease. But the key there is, you know, getting it early. And I think the other key is making sure you have a definitive diagnosis of, of SARS-CoV-2 infection as well. And it's not just going to be for every common cough, uh, cough and cold that there is. So that's going to be important. But hopefully, if we can keep people out of the hospital, and really that is the main function and the main uh, direction of these vaccines, and hopefully of these new pills as well. So you've got to be a little gratified if we switch back to just the vaccination points for a moment. You know, the U.S. rates had dropped about 700,000 a day. We're back up to 1.3, 1.4 million. Talk to us. Why the change? What's going on out there that's getting so many more people vaccinated? Oh, okay. So you're, you wanted me to talk about pediatric vaccine. Yes, I do. <laughs> How, that was a pretty good segue, though. I just kind of pitched it there. I know, I know. And, and I kind of was fumbled the catch a little bit. <laughs> That's, okay. That's okay. So um, I'm out. incredibly excited. I think so many people have waited for the vaccine to receive that emergency use authorization for 5 to 11-year-olds, and now we have it. And it's, it's safe, it's effective, it's available in places that we know that kids are more comfortable getting vaccinated. We know that parents are more comfortable seeking care. Um, and importantly, um, if you're a parent out there and your child is not yet vaccinated, if you get them vaccinated this week, they'll be fully vaccinated by Christmas. Um, so we can, I know. I know, that's right. Um, Santa so Claus it can is be, coming yes. to town. Let's I'm do sure, it. I'm sure kids are like, yes, I really would love a shot for Christmas. But maybe they would. Um, we know that there are a lot of kids who are really excited to get a vaccine. Um, so it's, it's wonderful news. And um, it it's is. something, again, that, that Asper has really worked actually with CDC as well 
to make sure that that all the information about those vaccines is available. So let's talk a little bit about that, Secretary Absolutely. O'Connell, because there's still a lot of inf misinformation out there and distrust. How do we keep trying to combat that? I mean, we try and talk about this all the time yeah. on the program, but what are what are the key things you point that or you think that we need to make sure we get across to Americans that they have more trust in this? Absolutely. So uh, one of the things we've been sure to emphasize, well, a couple of things. Yeah. Among the things we've been sure to emphasize is that these vaccines have gone through the uh, the required safety analysis that all vaccines go through. Even though we did it in an accelerated fashion, the development pieces, the safety pieces have followed exactly the way they always do. And as soon as FDA is issued their emergency use authorization, and for the Pfizer uh, general population, you know, their, uh, their licensing of that vaccine, that meant they felt it was safe for everybody, just like every other vaccine you take. So that's one of the things we emphasize. Another thing is when you're scrolling through the internet and uh, running across various articles, check the source of those articles. Make sure that they're coming from trusted uh, scientists, uh, from the CDC, from the FDA. You'll find significant amount of very helpful information on their websites, and we really encourage everyone uh, to fact check uh, the information that they're receiving. The Surgeon General, which of course, Dr. Satterwhite, you're part of uh, the organization where the Surgeon General uh, lives in HHS, uh, just released a toolkit uh, to combat misinformation and disinformation and uh, would encourage everyone uh, to look for that on the Surgeon General's website, uh, download it and, and, and apply some of the suggestions that he has going forward because it is a significant problem when people don't trust uh, these safe, uh, and effective vaccines. You know, I thought we call that the made up news network. Don't be part of the MUNs. And by the way, I heard your South Carolina accent come out just now. It just got, <laughs> you, you, it happened with my mom. She's from Texas. Whenever she got tired, I go, oh, you're from Texas. I forgot about that. <laughs> Wait, All right. I have one more thing. Please. One of the best things I've heard about misinformation actually is if you're not sure, don't share. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, you know, we tend to feel like maybe we can't crack that but everybody can play a role. If you're not sure, don't share. Yeah, go. You know, I would say, and I think the reality of it is, is that a lot of people have um, said that they like to do their own research and do their own research. Most of that really just focuses on looking at Facebook, however. I think what we've also said is it's important to find trusted people that you know, whether it's your pastor or your physician, and getting it directly from those people also. And I think the key is what we've said here, you don't want to be a rumory. I mean, you've already, mm -hmm. you learned one new term today, muns, and here's a rumory, <laughs> a rumor reporter. Don't be a rumory, don't <laughs> spread the muns. You want to just come That's out right. and do, and yeah. try and find out what's really going on. And, 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 and you know, there are so many people who spend their entire lives dedicated to research and trying to find the right information to find cures. And it's funny to me, folks are gonna probably trust this new Pfizer pill, right? I mean, why wouldn't you? It looks like a really good data and we gotta see all the data, but let's assume it's as good as they say it is. And all these other new therapies, they'll go get the new antibiotic. They're gonna go get that new chemotherapy. But a simple vaccination proven to be incredibly safe, built on a platform over 20 years yep. old, and all of a sudden it's, oh, it's rushed, it's been too rushed, it's just not safe, we just don't know. And like, actually, no, we do know, and we do know how safe it is. And that, that's the part that sometimes we find frustrating. And then you watch all these people come in the hospital and they're sick, they're dying, and that doesn't need to be so. That's the part that really hurts. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be so. And we could all be back to normal if we could all get folks vaccinated. How can we keep, keep we gotta keep saying it, right? We gotta keep putting that message out there. Okay, now we just went to church a little bit, so let's go on to the conversation. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, Secretary O'Connor, beyond COVID, can you talk a little bit more about the role ASPRA has played in helping step, states respond to uh, different disasters? For, for us, um, there was the uh, tornado in 2011 in Joplin, mm -hmm. the worst tornado that hit the U.S. in more than 60 years, killing approximately 160 people and injuring over 1,100. What role did ASPR and hell, uh, play in helping Missouri respond? By the way, we had a big bus that went down there. We called it the Jayhawks for Joplin, and we spent mm -hmm. a little time doing a little work there. But well, tell us a little bit how ASPR responded there. Absolutely. Well, the devastation from that tornado, while I, I know it was felt acutely locally, was, you know, all of us nationally mm -hmm. uh, mourned with the people of Joplin. And ASPR was pleased to be able to step in and play the role that we're intended to play, which is to coordinate public health emergency response. We sent 150 people immediately to 
Joplin. Uh, many of them, I think 100 of them, were the National Disaster Medical uh, Response teams that I mentioned earlier. They're uh, teams of clinicians that are able to, to come in and set up medical care in acute uh, response situations. Um, one of the, uh, you know, I know 25% of the buildings in Joplin uh, were were destroyed, 75% were damaged, including, you know, St. John's Regional Medical Center. And with the medical center offline, it was important that our team was able to come in and augment medical care immediately for the, uh, the survivors of the tornado as well as, you know, other people within the community that needed medical care for other reasons. So we were here and we were on the ground, uh, you know, with, within hours. Uh, we also sent, and this is one of the unfortunate roles that we play as well, we sent mortuary teams and we set up uh, a mortuary center to manage uh, the the folks that didn't survive and to be sure that they had you know th the respectful process that they need at the end um, to be able to have their you know be, be delivered back to their families and cared for in the appropriate way. Uh, so we were we, we we did that work too, and that's among the hardest work that we have to do. Uh, but it's important that that's done right as well, and and so we participated in that and we stayed on the ground for. Um, you know, for several months to support the recovery efforts. It's important, you know, that these communities are resilient and recover, uh, and that's an important role that ASPRA plays too, is to support that recovery. So it was um, just an example of one of the ways in which we come in and help in public health emergencies. Yeah, that is just so important, isn't it? All right, so Jess, let's see if there are questions out there that people might have for us. Uh oh, you're offline again, Jess. So Sarah has a question, and it kind of on what we were just just mentioning. But do you seek out volunteers to help implement with these response plans? Secretary O'Connell, thank you. Uh, we have what we call an intermittent uh, an intermittent intermittent workforce, and uh, they are clinicians that live in communities all around the country. And, and they can get called up for two week stints to be part of these disaster medical assistance teams. Um, and when they're called up, they are, uh, they become federal employees. So when they're with us and responding, they're federal employees. When they are um, in their communities, they're just community members. Uh, so they're intermittent in that regard. But uh, clinicians um, that are interested in volunteering and becoming part of this intermittent force, we'd, we'd welcome that. Uh, we have about uh, 4,800 on our rolls right now. We're trying to get up to 6,000. You hear this is a PSA from me, a plug to the community. So if community uh, clinicians are interested in helping and joining our NDMS service, we'd be more than happy uh, to have them join. So I have a question for you. Now, there, when we were in Job Member, there's AmeriCorps. Is AmeriCorps still out there doing work? AmeriCorps mm -hmm. is still out there doing work. They're, you know, they, they have different responsibilities than we have. We just respond to the public health emergencies. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's yeah. great. So uh, Jess, other questions? Yeah, Tiffany wants to know, where does COVID rank now as far as needing preparedness, maybe compared to other disasters that may be coming down the pike? Can you compare that maybe to what you thought about that last year to maybe how serious that is now? Secretary? That's a wonderful question because what we're starting to see is what it means to live with something like this. You know, the acute response early in, um, in 2020 felt a lot different than uh, our response now when we actually have these tools that we've talked about. We've had the vaccines, the therapeutics, the testing that we need. Uh, now we're not comfortable with where we are and we're wondering if we're about to hit a winter surge with numbers going up as we talked about at the beginning of the show. Um, so it doesn't mean that we're uh, letting our foot off the pedal at all. We just have uh, additional tools and we might have to figure out unfortunately uh, you know how to live with those tools a little bit longer until we can get ourselves uh, into lower case counts but what's important from our preparedness uh, perspective is that we continue to be vigilant but we don't have the luxury at ASPR to focus just on this current response we are always preparing for whatever comes next uh, in fact, we were down at Hurricane Ida in New Orleans uh, in the middle of the Delta surge responding to that hurricane. So we are constantly watching other threats and we will be prepared and have to be prepared for whatever comes. Uh, but we certainly are in a slightly better shape when it comes to the COVID response because we have these wonderful tools that we've talked about this morning. Secretary okay. O'Connell mentioned two things that I want to, I want to pull out. Um, one, that we're very much trying to, uh, to, to deal with a, a sort of an ongoing response and recovery. It's, it's so, ASPR is very much involved in recovery, but how do we recover from something that's still going on? Um, and part of that is how do we integrate um, COVID-19 management into steady state? So we've used the term pandemic. Endemic 
is kind of where we think COVID-19 is. We're going to have to live with it for a while. The question is, at what level? You know, we know that there's still a lot we can do to get our, our, our burden down, our burden down from case counts all the way through deaths, because we haven't, we're not fully utilizing those tools. Um, the other thing that I think I, that I wanted to build on was ASPR and the federal government is preparing um, to manage COVID-19 and be prepared for any future challenges that we have, and we know that they will happen. It's not an if, it's a when. Um, but our states are also very much trying to figure out how do we still do this very important COVID-19 work, but there's a lot of things that we need to make sure that we're not neglecting. All the other public health things, routine vaccinations. I know that Dr. Hawkinson yesterday was encouraging um, everyone, kids and adults, to make sure that you're up to date on your routine vaccines. Those are very important because the, the better health we have as a population, the normal stuff, the better as a population we're able to manage challenges like COVID-19. So let me ask you a question. You guys have to deal with this every day, right? It's, 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 some days have to be harder than others. When it comes to COVID-19, Secretary, what's been your worst moment? What was, what was the lowest moment you felt? That's a, a, a terrific question. I mean, I think we've been challenged so much for the last uh, 21 months. I came back into the administration in January, so I've only been on the front lines of this particular part uh, since January. And I would have to say one of the most discouraging times was um, watching the Delta numbers go up. You know, we had watched through, uh, through the spring, numbers go down, masks came off, um, and then we started seeing that steady climb starting in July. That was really, really hard to watch. But it's trained us that we, you know, this is an unpredictable virus and that we have to be prepared for that to happen at any given moment. We were just watching cases go down for a few weeks and now they're leveling out and ticking up again. So we just have to uh, be prepared for the, uh, for the unexpected and use the tools that we've talked about. And I think clearly the past teaches us about the future of the virus. The future is it's still out there. It is endemic, great term, good, great turn of phrase to it from pandemic. So it is always out there. And the minute we let our guard down, it will be back. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, it's a little like Arnold Schwarzenegger. What's your worst moment? I was actually, so I, I feel like I'm really glad you, you went first. Um, I, I actually was thinking about my personal moments. Yes. Um, so, so my husband um, is an ICU doctor and I work in the federal government public health. And I think some of my, my hardest moments were actually um, in the second wave. Well, which for us, so the first wave, um, you know, was in was in New York City a lot. We saw some some bad images, but for us here, it was it was um, really that the fall of last year, about a year ago, right, where we really started to go up ago. and to understand, um, you know, what we knew was coming in terms of um, both my time and my husband's time, and honestly, the impact on my children. Um, and so I think a lot of civil servants, like those in Asper, like those across HHS, and importantly all of our state and local public health partners and um, all of our medical professionals have devoted just um, a really unimaginable um, effort. And it's not just time, it's effort, it's thought to this pandemic um, at a great personal cost. So that's the hardest thing for me has actually been managing um, how to manage my personal time and make sure that my, my kids know that um, they're really important to me and, and that actually that they've had to make sacrifices too. We all have, haven't we? Jess. Joellen uh, wants to know, with lots of people under 50 who care for their elderly parents, many of them would like to get their booster to make sure that they're protecting their parents. When do you expect the CDC will update guidelines to help uh, allow for that? What do you guys think? I got it. Um, hi, that's a great question. Um, we actually do know that both Pfizer and Moderna have submitted data to the FDA to apply for an EUA, so that emergency use authorization, to um, see if they can get booster shots authorized for all adults. Mm -hmm. So FDA is currently reviewing that data. It will go through the same process that all of our vaccine data has gone through. Um, the FDA will review, and then their advisory committee, and then their leadership, and then the CDC advisory committee, and then the CDC director. Um, but I am optimistic that um, that process will work work through, and um, hopefully we'll have those available soon. And in fact, some states are already doing it, right? Yeah. Arkansas, Colorado, and other states have said, we want boosters for everybody. Yeah. How does that happen if the FDA hasn't got a full EUA out there? Be happy to take that. So, uh, you know, the states are doing that and uh, we don't recommend it. 
Uh, and we don't recommend it because we have something called the PREP Act, which uh, guarantees liability protection for uh, the, the vaccine manufacturers and those that are administering them. And the PREP Act follows the FDA's recommendations and the CDC's recommendations. So when you begin to, to use vaccine outside of that, you are outside of the PREP Act liability protections. And should you get injured uh, in, in receiving this vaccine, which is not happening very often, um, but you know, should something happen, you will not be protected if you are using it outside of the, the guidelines recommended. So that's one of the reasons why we don't encourage uh, people to to go beyond where FDA and CDC are right now. But I have a strong feeling they're about to catch up. Yeah, I bet they do. Just to say, you know, there's an also an article coming out of Australia with all, where they have something where they pay people for problems from vaccinating whatever. And they're saying the numbers that they have are so incredibly low. It's like 0.33% of people even have something that could be considered a side effect. But that doesn't even mean it's serious. That could have been a sore arm and things like that. So we know yeah. that the side effect profile of these vaccines is incredibly safe. Mm -hmm. Here's my worst moment. My worst moment is watching something that is really a public health emergency become a political tool. Mm -hmm. It was, it, that's just wrong. And it just, it when you take care of people and you watch people suffer and die and have long haul syndrome, it hurts you to your core, to your core, uh, to watch something that is really about all of us become a political tool. And, and that has made this whole thing so much harder because we know the right answer. We know what to do but we get into this political battle over it. And that is just, that's just wrong. And it's unfortunate that people have to suffer that and the leaders perpetuate that. Mm -hmm. that, that. That just hurts your core. Worst moment, Hawk? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with you. I think you uh, certainly can separate the science and the data from everything else. Yeah. And you can, uh, with that, then take it to whatever political realm you're in. But mostly it's keeping people safe and that's what we wanna do. And we've seen the problems that, that the pandemic has um, has exaggerated or exposed even more, and that's uh, health and inequity, and that's socioeconomic inequity. And now we are all dealing with supply chain issues. Um, it didn't have to be like this. You know, keeping people healthy is a lot better for prosperity of the country as a whole. And so we know how to do that, but unfortunately, it has become uh, one more piece of division throughout yeah, the country. Too much. And as we like to say, say, we'd much rather have people live long and that's prosper. Right. Get your vaccine <laughs> yeah. right there. Jess. So, um, Christine, kind of on the other uh, end of the spectrum, do we have any idea when vaccines will be approved for kids five and under? Um, yeah, soon. January. Um, I'm going to go with 2022. Yeah, that's 2022. What do you think, Secretary? That's what we're hearing, February, January. Yep. Okay, let's go. Sooner or better. Yes. All right. All right. Sounds good to me. Okay, so Sarah just needs a little help and a little advice. She's a wee bit nervous to get her booster shot. Didn't have a great reaction to the second Pfizer dose. Fever, bad chills, really sick. Um, that kind of freaked her out. So any insight on getting the booster and being nervous about getting it? I, I would imagine that would scare some people yeah, off. Yeah, Hawkeye, you know, really the booster so far, I think yeah. we're doing pretty well on the side effect profile. Yeah, absolutely, and, and there's really no correlation between the second one and, and the third dose of, of really if you'll have a reaction or not. So I think that's important to note. Um, you know, would still encourage it, especially if you are in some of that high risk uh, groups or demographics to go ahead and get that. Um, if you need to, just plan to do it on a Friday or plan to do it when you can take a day or two off of work. So here's my story, man. I got whacked by that second dose of Moderna, and I was out for a day, and high fever, was feeling terrible. Got my booster shot. It was about eight months later. Got my booster mm -hmm. shot. Yeah. Nothing. I was felt felt good. So you know, I, it it is really unpredictable. That's what we're seeing in our clinic here. We've given a, over a hundred thousand doses of vaccine, well over a hundred thousand now, and uh, I'm here to tell you that what you had on the second shot of Pfizer Moderna may not be what you're going to have on the booster shot. So I think I'd go full speed ahead. And it beats COVID, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't, it, it COVID. doesn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I've had a couple of good friends recently um, who ended up getting COVID-19. Uh, and um, they had both had a uh, vaccination. They were doing okay. But because of some health concerns, also got monoclonal antibody therapy. They've done great. And I think, you know, you, you don't have to struggle with this, folks. If you get vaccinated and if you're in a high-risk category, get your monoclonal antibody therapy. And I think within the very near future, hopefully that'll be, be just a couple of pills okay. from, from Pfizer or Merck. That'll be, that'll be awesome. Jess. 
Taylor We're winding wants to down. Know. We're gonna, we got a couple more minutes. Okay, a couple more questions. Okay, what do you make of Dr. Fauci stating in an interview last week that the immunity from the vaccine is waning for infection, hospitalization, and death? He stated he believes everyone will need an additional booster. Thoughts? Hawk? Yeah, you know, I'd really like to see that, that quote and, and what the context it was. Um, you know, again, we really, it's difficult to apply our country and our demographics to other countries, but we do take some, um, some points from other countries such as Qatar or Israel um, and all this real world data. And certainly we, what we have seen is that those, um, those groups, especially over 65, do have, um, say, a contracted or less immunity protection against hospitalization and severe disease. Uh, but for everybody else, it still looks really good. We've also had some good data from our VA administration as well about what they have in their patients. So, um, you know, overall, we know that um, antibody levels decrease over time. That is just what happens with immunity. But we still have very good memory function of those B cells to create antibodies soon after exposure, but also the memory function of our T cells as well, overall to help protect us against going to the hospital, going to the ICU and dying. And so we really kind of need to wait and see um, exactly what will transpire now with this new wave of data. Uh, but you know, eventually, uh, people have also said maybe overall three doses of vaccine if you're not immunocompromised will be the gold standard moving forward. So we just have to wait and see. Thoughts, Dr. Sauer? Yeah, the other, um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is booster shots are not uncommon with other routine mm -hmm. vaccines. And the schedule that we give booster shots evolves as we get more data. So we could end up needing a booster shot in five years. Um, it's, it'll be interesting to see what the data show. Um, and you know, we, we used to call the booster shot was actually um, a, a TDAP. So um, the boost, booster is a general vaccine practice in many cases. Yeah, and I think the key is that it, even though it may wane a little, we're still seeing pretty darn good outcomes. Yeah. If we look at our hospitalized patients, we just don't see many deaths at all in, a vaccine, in the vaccinated category unless you had really severe uh, other illnesses like you've had an organ transplant and you've had advanced cancer chemotherapy or other drugs to suppress your immune system. So we're seeing pretty good results on vaccination still. Yeah, that, and just remember too that as you get further out from your second dose, your immune system continues to evolve. And what we have seen is that you are creating further immune responses to those variants that we know about, but more than likely even the variants we haven't seen yet. And so you continue to have that evolution of your immune response um, even further out from, uh, from your original dosing. So that is, um, that is one thing to be said, and that's just a, an amazing thing about our immune system. And well. it's also uh, notable that our own host uh, native immunity wanes faster than vaccine-induced immunity in this situation. So, Jess. Okay, last two questions. Laura's yes, asking, so do you recommend everyone get the booster even if they're not high risk? But we can't say that officially yet. Yeah. I, I'm with you. I'm, I'm hoping that that comes out pretty soon. But, it's coming soon. But Secretary yeah. O'Connell, we, we're not, we can't really say that to everybody just yet. Right. Yeah, right. I mean, I think you have to understand why are we saying this? Why are we doing this? Again, what we have seen is that even eight plus months out from the original vaccine series, you still have very good protection against hospitalization, severe disease and death. Maybe less so if you are in that population 65 and older, uh, but for the, for the general population and in those ages under that, you still have very good protection provided from the vaccines. Now, if you're talking about helping reduce any infection whatsoever, or possibly even helping reduce a little bit of transmission, we know that your immune response, especially in those first 90 days or first three months after that vaccine, dose um, is the highest and has further protection against even any infection whatsoever. Jess, All right, last so question. Many, so many great questions today. So I just want our viewers to know we'll get to these the rest of the week. So stay tuned for that. But the last question goes to Isaac, and I think it's a really good one to wrap it up. Will there ever be a time when we really don't have to think about COVID anymore as far as how we live our daily lives? Secretary O'Connell. Let's hope so. <laughs> you know, our, I think our intention is uh, to make COVID as manageable as every other, um, you know, seasonal influenza or respiratory virus or other things that we deal with um, in day-to-day -day life. And if COVID is truly going to be endemic, 
Um, it would be nice to only think about it when you have to get your annual COVID shot or whatever we land on uh, mm -hmm. for sustainment moving forward. But, you know, I think our goal is to get us to where we're steady state. And, uh, and if COVID is going to be with us, that we manage it in a way that it doesn't occupy all of our time and space as it has these last 21 months. But I'm sure others have a reaction to that. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, I would say, again, this is purely speculation, but we know that other coronaviruses have jumped species in, into humans um, hundreds of years ago or a thousand years ago. You know, I do anticipate that day. It's just a matter of when. I think vaccination is going to help us get there, especially because we know the benefits of vaccination in sparing so many lives. Um, but as we have our children now who are going to be growing up with it and their immune system becomes more um, uh, uh, prepared for it and can see it and recognize it, that hopefully we won't have those same type of either long COVID symptoms or acute illnesses that we see in driving people to the hospital. So I do anticipate, I don't know when, I think vaccination is helping to get us there sooner, um, but it will, be, it will be more than several years down the road. But I think until that time, we do have science and data and vaccination and hopefully now these new drugs to help us with that. Dr. Satterwhite? I think um, one of the things, I think what the, the thing that I was, that I feel like will stay with us through COVID-19, and actually it's something that we had sort of forgotten a little bit, is um, this idea that um, we'll have to stay home if we're sick. So even though mm -hmm. I think we are adapting to a world with COVID-19, some things will change, um, maybe for a long time, but they're, they're okay and they're actually gonna help us in the long haul. Final thoughts from today. Final thoughts. Um, I really wanna thank um, Assistant Secretary O'Connell for joining us. Um, my work in Region 7 has very much um, been a collaborative process with her team here, and it's been wonderful, and I think that partnership has allowed us um, to better serve the population of Region 7, so I will cede to you. Dr. Or Secretary O'Connell. Wonderful, thank you. And the feeling is mutual. One of the things I've learned is that, um, you know, emergencies all start regionally, locally, and it's important for me not to sit in Washington, D.C. Uh, and hear about these things, but actually to come out and meet with the teams that we have here and to encourage the, the sort of collaboration, Dr. Satterwhite, that you were mentioning, uh, to make sure that we're synced up and ready for whatever comes next. So I want to thank you and your teams, of course, for that wonderful collaboration here in Region 7. And what a terrific opportunity to be in this hospital today to see all the good work you all have done in the hardest of times. It's been really remarkable, and I will carry that back with me as I continue to assess where we are uh, take lessons learned, apply those moving forward, um, and prepare for whatever comes next. So I really want to thank you all for, um, for having me. Thank you. Final thought talk. Yeah. I would say, you know, please go get vaccinated. It is so vitally important, as we talked about. It will help spare lives, spare going to the hospital. If you have anybody who is five and over, please go get them vaccinated. My uh, nephew, who is now six years old, was able to get his first dose of vaccine on Saturday, and he's been doing well, not even a sore arm. So please go get vaccinated. And as far as preparing for the next one, we know that there are thousands of coronaviruses out there in bat species and, and other animals. We know that there are different populations living next to these species and these animals. And so it's vitally important to go on the offensive and to prepare for the next one and have those resources there that, so that we can learn and understand when that might be and how best to protect us against it. You know, <clears throat> as I listen to this conversation today and the great work that you and your team have done and, and the great work that Dr. Sarway's team has done locally, I'm reminded that everyone needs someone, right? Ultimately, we all need each other. And um, I think the most important thing about this pandemic is it's not just a, a pandemic of Republicans or Democrats or red states or blue states or black or white or, or Asian. It doesn't matter. It's a pandemic of all of us. And, and the way out of this is to remember that we all do need someone. And to do that, it means we have to tell the truth. We have to have an honest conversation. And we have to be prepared to reach across any aisle, any distance, and any gulf to try and help each other. We're here to help. KU, from all your chief medical officers here regionally, you're gonna have a conversation with them shortly. Uh, all the great work the teams have done here throughout the city. But ultimately, we need your help. And the help that you can provide us most is to take the science seriously and listen to the truth. And remember that vaccination saves your life 
and all of those who help you and all those people who need you. Vaccines work. Monoclonal antibody therapy works. And when sometimes things fail, then we're here to help. But we need to help ourselves. And we need to make a difference. And we can do that because, you see, we all need someone. Jess? Great message, Dr. Seitz, and thank you to our great guest today. What a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Uh, we just want to remind everyone to send the pics in of your kids and your grandkids taking their shots. Be like AJ. We want to show kids being brave and showing others how it's done. So send those in via Facebook, or you can email them to the Medical News Network. Uh, so thank you to everyone for just being with us today. Don't forget, you can catch our shows anytime on our Facebook page. You can also check us out on our YouTube channel tomorrow. It's Open Mics with Dr. Stites. Yes, he is back. We know COVID can cause a number of health issues. We talk about this all the time, but especially issues with the heart. We're gonna talk about the advances in stroke and interventional medicine, plus how the virus is impacting heart doctors throughout all of the health systems. And we're gonna share the story of a man who says it's a miracle and faith that is keeping him alive. So please join us for those stories and much more tomorrow at eight. Have a fantastic Tuesday. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites Podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.